Last week I started a sermon, didn't I? And I didn't finish it on the royal, powerful family of God. Well, the Lord's told me to go back to that again to kind of help us know who we are. This is called the overcoming family of God. And we are the royal, powerful family of God, but we are also the overcoming family of God if we're walking where God wants us to walk. 1 John 5, verse 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That's us. We believe Jesus is the Son of God, and we are overcomers. We were made in God's image, created to have dominion, created to be people of power. I've also found that dominion is available to every believer if we just grab hold of it and use it. God wants us to do that. What he told Adam, he tells us today. You have dominion over everything on this earth through the power of the blood of Jesus now who took back what Adam lost and the Holy Spirit that lives in you. People in God's royal family are people of power and sometimes we don't remember or recognize What power we have. It's no good to have power unless you know you have it. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So what I want to do is shift some knowledge from my mind and heart to yours today. Because once you have knowledge, you're responsible for it. So I want to shift from me to you today this knowledge about who you are. Because without the knowledge of the true relationship with God, you can't possess dominion over the conflicts in your life. You need to always be aware of who you are in Christ and who you are in this earth. When you know you're a child of the King, you move beyond the limits of the orphan spirit. Too many Christians live as orphans. They live as if they're out there alone, that they have no backup. They have nobody. They're not attached to anything. I believe God. I love God. And I know he loves me, but I'm just out here on my own in a world and a sea of unbelievers. And I don't know what to do about it. Well, it's time to learn what to do about it. When you know you're a child of the King, you put your feet under his table. You grab hold of the power that he has because you belong to Christ. You're part of the royal family of God and you're no longer an orphan. You've been fully adopted as if you were a birth child into that family. You've all the rights of a birth child in a family. Once you know who you are, you'll realize this world's not your home. Carol, you were right. You're thinking about heaven. You start thinking about heaven. You realize this great family reunion we're going to have is not going to take place in Branson. It's not going to take place in America. It's not going to take place in, a, in Europe. It's not going to take place in this ball of mud called earth. It's not going to happen here. Your home and my home is in heaven. And our, some of our family's already there. How many got family already there waiting on it? We're going there. We're, yeah, we're coming. We're coming. Maybe not today, but we're coming. But that's because that's our home, because that's our family. That's why there's a battle raging For the soul of every human being, including you and me. This is the challenge that we have to remember this. It's a battle between time and eternity. Between life and death. Between heaven and hell. You are the territory over which this war is raging. The devil hates us. Voice translation says in Ephesians 6.12. I read it last week. I'm going to read it again. I love this translation. We're not waging war against enemies of flesh and blood alone. No. This fight is against tyrants, against authorities, against supernatural powers and demon princes that slither in the darkness of this world and against wicked spiritual armies that lurk about in heavenly places. Voice translation. By the way, Bible Gateway is a great place to look at a lot of translations. It's free. It's an app you can put on your computer or your phone. Satan is the enemy of God And he is the enemy of all God's creation. He hates all of us. He hates mankind. Because we're born in the image and the likeness of God. He wants us to be reborn in his image. The image of Satan himself. But we refuse because we know who we are. Actually, Satan's afraid of you. Don't forget that. You know, we cower in the corner because, oh, there's an evil spirit. Listen, you take dominion over that evil spirit. David said it well. I'm going to read it. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you 
shall prosper. And every tongue which arises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Stand up to the devil, that's what it says. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. This is who you are. Satan hates you because of who your father is. You've been born of God himself. When you begin to understand this, it gives you an advantage in in the fight against the satanic forces of this world. Don't allow the devil to take your territory, that territory being you, and create strongholds in your life. You know, every day you're either taking ground or losing ground. You're not standing still. There's no demilitarized zone here. No safe place to run to. The only safe place is in Jesus. I'm telling you, uh, there's no resting place in this fight because the devil will keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. And there's only one reasonable course. And we have to understand the battle to fight it and win because the battle is the Lord's and it's not ours. We stand in his strength. We stand in his might. You can win this. Let me remind you, God created us to be free. Can't be who we were created to be without freedom. If all the Lord wanted was some automated, perfect, harmonious worship, He could have just created, you know, robots, some computer program. Just praise them all the time. But God didn't want that. He created us <laughs> so we could will in our own mind and spirit to worship Him, to choose to worship Him. 2 Corinthians 3.17 shows one of the basic differences here. It could be translated, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. In the domain of the enemy, in that dark domain, there's fear and bondage and oppression. There's trouble and chaos. But in the kingdom of God, there's love and faith and there's freedom. The devil wants to enslave you and put you in bondage, put you in prison so you can't get out. He wants you to be addicted. He wants you to be torn up. He wants your family to come, become separated and destroyed. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy everything that you've been given. God wants you to be free, filled with abundance, filled with love, filled with the Spirit of God. There's no liberty in the dark kingdom. But God is all about freedom. He is all about liberty. Look, God planted a tree in the Garden of Eden, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't do that to trick Adam and Eve. He did that to give them the opportunity to love Him in freedom. That's why. I mean, there's no liberty without the freedom to disobey. There's no liberty in prison. There's no liberty when you're locked behind bars. No freedom there. That's what the devil's plan is for your life. To lock you up and throw the key away. That's what he wants. America's a good example of that principle. But freedom is not free. Freedom takes a fight to get there. Uh, you're, you're given automatically born into a fleshly nature. We know that. Born into sinful attitudes. You don't have to teach somebody how to sin. You don't have to teach your kids how to sin. That's a part of the birth nature they were given by the fact that they were created from the womb of woman on earth. The fact is you have to teach them how not to be terrorists and murderers and bank robbers and addicts. You have to say, we will not allow that in your life. We will pray. We will bombard heaven. We will teach you. So this tree was planted there to give them a way to show their love and obedience to God. And every temptation in your life is given to you for that same particular purpose. And this doesn't infringe on the sovereignty of God. I want you to understand it. In fact, it illuminates God's sovereignty. The fact that He's given you a free will to choose whether to love Him or not. The greatest and most noble authority that you will ever have in your life is always demonstrated by the freedom that it gives its subjects. That's why if... Why are people... Why is there not a wall for us to get out of this nation... Why are they trying to build a wall to keep people from getting into this nation? The reason is people want to come where there is freedom. And once it's explained, once they know it, they want to come to a place where they can be free. Not a seat should be empty in this place this morning. The devil has tricked enough people 
to leave a lot of seats vacant. And that's true in every church in this city today. There are seats vacant that should be filled. Filled with people who are committed to staying free. The Lord wants us to worship Him and reject evil, but He gave us freedom. So I want you to understand that principle. We should obey God. We should do what He says simply because we love Him, not because we're commanded to. Freedom involves choices that we make, but there's also consequences that are attached to every decision you make. So the decisions bring consequences, and when you really love God, there are consequences that come with that that are wonderful consequences. The fact is that people don't really see that part of it. With our freedom comes a great responsibility. We also know that. Now, I grew up in Texas, and uh, Cheryl's my little sister, and I was really, really good to her. <laughs> and she was only about a year old when uh, and this memory came back to me this week. I was probably five or six, probably five, and I had uh, lots of toys. Trucks, cowboy hats, Texas stuff. You know, I had toy guns. We always had guns. We're in Texas, you know, guns. I had a bow with arrows, toy cars, bats, baseballs, footballs. Had all that stuff. And I didn't like anybody to get in my stuff and move it around and mess it up. I certainly didn't want my mom or anyone else to put my things away. And if Cheryl at one or two got into it, boy, she got in trouble from me. One of my most cherished possessions was my sheriff's badge. I used to watch Roy Rogers and Gene Autry and, you know, the Lone Ranger. Anybody here old enough? Yeah. How many of you don't even know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. I thought so. Wait a minute. I say, wait, wait, wait. But I'd get up in the morning and put on my badge. <laughs> or most of the time when I was five, because I was from Texas. Actually, I was born in Oklahoma. We moved to Texas as soon as we read about it. <laughs> and as soon as our mom and dad could read, they, they moved over there, right? Yeah. My dad said to my mom, I said, you know what my badge means? No. I said, it means don't touch my stuff. She didn't like that very well. <laughs> I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, that badge is important to me. But I still wear a badge. You know that? You, you can't see it, really. But it's a badge that has a lot of power and authority to it. It's backed up in the name of Jesus. You see, when I wear that badge, I have authority. I carry. Yeah, I'm a carrying badge-wearing person. I carry. I carry my weapon. I got it. It's in here, too. It's inside me. So not only do I carry the badge. I know what that means. I know what that authority is all about. So when you don't want people to, you know what your stuff is? I, you know, I said to my mom uh, that my badge means don't touch my stuff. Leave my stuff alone. What's your stuff? What's your, it's your family. It's your money. It's your house. It's your goods. It's your car. It's your body. It's everything you have in this life while living here on earth. So you need to, you need to remember you pull that back and say, oh, yeah, I do have a badge. It's got Jesus on it. It says, devil, get your hands off my stuff. Don't touch my stuff because my weapon is right here, and I'm ready to pull the trigger on you if you try it. Five years old, I believe my sheriff's badge had authority. I, I believe that because I watched Roy and Gene and Lone Ranger and those guys, and I knew what it meant to have a badge. Eventually, I grew up and started watching Gunsmoke. So, you know, authority is a big deal. I want you to get this today. This is a big deal. If you don't know you have it, you won't use it. It's simple, isn't it? See, most of us get in a fearful attitude when we look in our rearview mirror and there's flashing lights behind us. Why are you in fear? You think you were speeding, maybe, the red light back there? Why do you get in fear? Because you know that policeman has authority. He can take you to jail if he wants to. He can arrest you. And you know where he gets his authority? Not just in his own personal body. I've told you this story before. Damascus, Arkansas. Three cars traveling along. I didn't know the other two. 
all along together. And I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. I'm just driving. Damascus, a little wide spot in the road. You drive through it. Well, red lights behind me, blue lights, whatever they were. And this gal gets out. Where is, uh, where's Sharon Mackey? Vernette, stand up. Sharon, stand up. These ladies are small. What, how tall are you? How tall are you? I didn't say how much you weigh or how old you are. I just want to know how tall you are. <laughs> What's that? Four, eleven and a half. How about you, Vernette? Well, there you go. We'll give you a rose later or something. You win. <laughs> that, you can sit down. This little gal that pulled us over, Carol was in the car. She was probably not as tall as you guys. Maybe four, nine, four, ten. And she was thin. But she had on her uniform, she had a gun. She had a badge. I knew I could take her. Boom. <laughs> I did ask her, why'd you stop me? There were three of us running along together. And she said, I had to get one of you. I said, oh, she said, you're the lucky one. Thank you. <laughs> she told me what to do. And you know what? I did it. Exactly like she told me. Why? It wasn't her size, was it? It wasn't her personal power. It was her authority. I didn't know any of the city councilmen or the commissioners in Damascus, Arkansas. I didn't know the governor at that time in Arkansas. But I knew this. She had everything they possessed in power and authority in her little uniform. In that badge. I'd like to suggest to you that every morning when you get up to put on your weaponry, your armor of God, that you put your badge of authority on as well. Amen. Don't just put the protective gear, you put the aggressive gear to go after the devil, to go into his territory, to run toward the giant instead of cowering in the corner. As a believer, you start speaking it. You start knowing who you are. You start saying, devil, get away from my stuff. You have no power over me. I have the authority and the backup of heaven itself and the blood of Jesus and the word of my testimony. Leave my stuff alone. Get out of my life. Enough is enough. I won't have it anymore. That's what we say to the devil. Don't forget your badge. And don't forget who you are. Don't touch my stuff, devil. It's over. We've got to learn. We have authority. We just got to learn to walk in it. We got to learn to put the badge on. It doesn't fall into your lap like ripe apples. You got to know what that authority is about. You got to go here enough and have enough in you and know where to go to find it when you're in a weak moment when the devil tries to attack you. You got to know what scripture to read. You got to say, Lord, help me find that one that I know shows me my power over him. James 1 6. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Because such a person is double-minded. One translation said double-spirited. Hmm. Double-spirited. My spirit or your spirit? That's the question, isn't it? Do I do what you say do or do I do what I want to do? Such a person is double-minded and unstable. I don't know if you're sinking, that's sinking in, if you're getting that. I don't want to be unstable. I want to have stability. I want to know my authority. I want to walk in it. This kind of person is up one minute and down the next. They're believers one day and the next day they're unbelievers. They're, they're doubters and they, they, can't, they can't figure it out. God said the devil will make sure that you don't get anything from the Lord. You've got to stay on track, folks. You've got to be... One mind, and that mind is the mind of Christ. You've got to be one spirit. You've got to allow the Holy Spirit to direct you. Jesus is the power of attorney in your life. He transferred everything he had to you. Straight from God's throne. Power of attorney is person number one. Has the right to act 
in the name of person number two. That's what that means. When I give you power of attorney over my finances, you can write checks. You can clean my bank account out. You can go to the ATM. When I give you power of attorney over my health, you can tell them to pull the plug, do not resuscitate, or you can say, keep on going. You have all that power. Jesus said, I give you power and authority over all the power of the devil in my name. You hold the power of attorney. And that's why he could say, I'm going away, I'm sending somebody else. His name is the Holy Spirit. And you're going to do what I did, but you're going to do greater things than I did. Because I'm going to the Father. And as I sit at the Father and I plead your case, and you use your power of attorney, you'll have authority just like I had. The problem is some people want deep, deeper revelations from God, but they, don't, they haven't mastered the first level first. Mark eleven twenty two. New King James says this. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Actually, if you go back to the Greek translation, it says, have the faith of God. That means I can speak things into existence if I have the faith of God, because God's faith spoke the world into existence through his words. Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now, a lot of people have trouble with this idea. You know, once in a while, I'll be on some of these uh, pages on the Internet. I'm reading about uh, scriptural things, pastors and other things, and people will slam the prosperity gospel. Well, I understand what they're talking about. Um. We are a faith church. We are a word church. We are a church that is spirit filled. I simply believe everything the word of God says. Here's the deal. Prosperity is not a bad word. I live in a prosperity gospel. God created the abundance in my life. And God wants me to have more of it. He wants to bless me abundantly. Amen. Why would I ever live beneath the privilege knowing that I am a child of the King who has created everything and who has owns everything and who has given me the right and the power and the authority to call it into existence straight from heaven's throne? Amen. Why would I not want that? A lot of people don't believe you can have what you say. Even though they read in the Word. You can really get to know people hanging around them a little bit and listening to them. You can discover if they're uh, uh, doubters or faithers, if they're in faith or in unbelief. And, you know, you can tell the devil. When you tell the devil, don't touch my stuff, get away from my stuff, you can say it with authority, but you have to believe it. And a lot of people who are in, and I understand why these guys say, yeah, the prosperity gospel. But here's the deal. There are a lot of people who are saying it without believing it, and nothing's happening. You see, it comes from the basis, the foundation, the floor of this thing is that I believe every word that's in the Bible. I don't skip the Holy Spirit part. I don't skip 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Oh, we'll take pieces of that, but we don't believe it's for today. Wait, wait, wait. God sure churned up a lot of uh, geography teaching us how to use the Holy Spirit through the letter of Paul to the Corinthians if he didn't want us to use it, didn't he? That's New Testament. And they discount it. Let me tell you, when you know what the Word of God says, in the spirit realm, and you know you have authority, you can get on an airplane, and you can do as my wife does, and before, as, and she might hold people up behind us just a little bit, but she'll lay her hand on the fuselage at that door, and she'll command that plane in the name of Jesus to fly correctly, to have no trouble, and that we will land safely, and then we get on that plane. Now, Brother Ron, he's a 20-year American Airlines pilot. And you know what, Brother Ron? I know that there's some of those guys that uh, we've heard that get drunk. I know that wasn't you, and try to fly those planes. Because you're a man filled with the Holy Spirit. 
But aren't you glad for somebody like her? Riding in your plane? Knowing that you are safe because you're riding with her. Because she has authority to tell that plane to fly correctly, to stay in the air. Sober, drunk, addicted, it doesn't matter who the pilot is. We know who the pilot is. His name is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is riding along with Carol and with Gary. I'm just glad to be in the plane with her, I'm telling you. (laughs) Hallelujah. We've got to learn the difference between being arrogant because we know a few phrases that we can say that relate to the Word and being filled with the Holy Spirit and knowing actually who we are in Christ. If you know who you are in Christ, you can speak into the atmosphere and change the weather. You say, whoa, now you're getting way out there. Did Jesus do it? Did people in the Old Testament do it? You don't think we can do it? What's changed? Not God. Not the Holy Spirit. Not the Word. We have. We've discounted those stories. We've discounted those ideas. We've discounted that, that acknowledgement of the power that we as believers have. I'm just trying to resuscitate some of you in the Spirit today. I'm telling you. Some of you, are not, if not dead, you're dying. And I need you to come back to life. I need you to step it up. If we're going to change the world, we're not going to do it sitting in here going, oh, I wish you'd hurry up and get through because it's 12.09 and I've got lunch. If you're in a hurry for lunch, get up and go now. I'll close my eyes. So, so I won't judge you later, okay? Hurry, hurry, got to hurry. Okay. In the jungle, when a predator sees fear in the eyes of the prey, he knows he's won. You can never let the devil see your fear. In fact, you need no fear. Let there be no fear in your heart, in your mind, in your life. Don't you ever let the devil, well, they say don't ever let them see you sweat. <laughs> well, don't you ever let the devil see you in fear. In fact, reduce fear to zero in your life. Ephesians 1.16 Because we're strong. We have authority. I cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. How many pray for somebody else? You know, uh, Thursday night, by the way, the Tharps were great Thursday night. Brother Marty preached such a marvelous sermon. Such such power in his ministry. And at the end, he had people forward. And the Lord spoke to my heart, pray for other people. That's what this box is about. This box doesn't have your name in it. It has names of folks you know need prayer. We pray for others. Jesus didn't come for me, for himself. He came for me and you. Jesus came for others. So he said, I, I pray for you. I give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. How many want more spirit and more revelation? More spirit revelation in your life. Glory to God. In the knowledge of Him, how many want to know Jesus more and more and more? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Glory to God. I will begin to proclaim if I have not yet, and I have, but you should, that I have the wisdom of God flowing out of me for every decision, for every choice. I will continue to say that I have the mind of Christ. You know, Jesus didn't promise us the spirit of stupidity, but a lot of Christians live in that spirit. Just make stupid decisions. Don't ask God. Go headlong into things that they shouldn't even be dealing with. He's given you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ. That's what the mind of Christ is. We need more of the knowledge of Jesus. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He got us out of the mess that Adam got us into. He came to strip Satan of his power, and he did it. He disarmed him, says uh, uh, one of the scriptures in Corinthians 2.15, I believe it is. He gave us the power of attorney. He gave us the power to act in His name. We can do miracles in His name. We can command things in His name. Spirit of wisdom and revelation and power and authority. In the upper room, He gave the Holy Spirit to live in us, to change us. And the rhema life came as well. We often hear the question asked, what would Jesus do? Well, I'll tell you what He'd do. If He were here right now, He'd heal the sick, cast out devils. He'd raise the dead. He'd have the wisdom to know what our needs are and to create a 
space so that we would know who he is. Does he know who you are? Does the enemy know who you are? Satan afraid of you today? When you get up in the morning, put your feet on the floor, does hell shake just a little bit? Because they know who you are. Have you made yourself known to the enemy of God? Do they shriek in fear? Oh, he's up. Look out. Or she's up. Look out. Do they put up the barriers to protect themselves against what you're about to throw at them in your prayer life, in your Bible study? They're screaming, be careful when you get around him because he knows who he is in Christ. He knows he's been made the righteousness of God. Righteousness, right standing. He knows. So you see, when hell starts telling us that we're in trouble, <laughs> and when we start saying, oh no, I, I'm, I'm going to hide from the devil under my blanket. I, I'm going to cover it up in my bedroom. I guess it's over. End time's coming. I, I don't know what the devil's going to We've forgotten who we are when we treat ourselves like that. We've forgotten that we're the child of the king. We have a right to a heavenly inheritance. But we've got to walk in that inheritance. We've got to have the power of God in our life every day. Ephesians 1.19, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is come to come, he hath put all things under his feet. If he put all things under his feet, where do you think they are in your life? They're under your feet too. You just have to take hold of it. He's put Satan under our feet. When you walk out of these doors this morning, sickness tries to come on you. What are you going to say? Oh, no. I knew it was coming. I could feel it. I had a little cough. <laughs> now I think I'm getting the flu. I think I'm about to die. I'm at death's door. Pray that God will pull me through. You get that going home. So when you say, oh no, sickness is coming on me. <sighs> Cry, God help me. Do something. And God says, wait, you do something. I think sometimes that's what God says back to us. God, help me. God, do something. Help yourself. Do something. I've already given you the word. I sent my son Jesus to die and shed his blood on Calvary. Why don't you do something? Why you always think I've got to do it all? Now, he probably wouldn't say it like that to you. He might. He said, whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Can he make it any more clear? Bind that sickness in the name of Jesus. Use your power of attorney. Take the name of Jesus. Bind it up. Say, I will not have it. I will stay with the power of, that I've got within me. And I will call the Word of God to life in my life. Because you're an authorized dealer of the power of God in this earth. You should be able to speak it and have it done. You've been adopted into this royal family. You're a joint heir with Jesus. You have everything He has. See, look. We forget that this, the real world is not this world. The real world is another realm. The real world is the realm of the Spirit of God. That realm of the Spirit of God, that supernatural realm will move heaven into earth. That's what we do when we start saying, instead of saying, I think I'm getting the flu. I think I'm getting sick. I think I'm about to be broke again. I don't have enough. When we say those things, we're confessing what the devil wants us to say. You have authority to overcome the enemy in every way, but you've got to start with your words. Start speaking the Word of God. Submit yourself to God's authority, and the devil will submit to your authority. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is where we are. This is where we live. Now, wait, wait, wait. If you're constantly living in sin... If you're playing on the devil's playground and you're disobedient to God, your words will really mean very little. God honors those who are connected and obedient. Yeah, you probably still go to heaven one day. God will meet you again at your, on your deathbed. You'll have a renewing, maybe. You can't say, get away from me, devil. Don't touch my stuff when you're on his playground because that's not your stuff. You're playing with his stuff. When you're living under God's discipline, when you're obedient to God. Galatians 5.16 says, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what we have to understand is, flesh has to come in line. Keep your mind and your heart fixed on the Word of God. Stay in the Word. Keep the Word in you. Move into your authority. Allow God to do 
what only He can do.